In 2012, the precursor to Kidney Cure, the ASN Foundation for Kidney Research, was founded. From its earliest days, it supported young investigators changing kidney care, giving them the resources to make a difference through innovation and research, all while bringing new trailblazers into the fold and continuing to live our mission with the name we all know so well today, with greater resources than we ever imagined. We are using research and innovation to prevent and cure kidney diseases. We fund new research and inspire new investigators to tackle this important challenge. And we support those who are changing kidney care and bringing new approaches that improve treatments. We have brought new voices to the table and we have helped secure new resources and millions of dollars in support. We are so proud of what we have accomplished over the last 10 years, but our work is not done. We are looking forward to the day when we can say, mission accomplished, and we live in a world without kidney diseases. Please welcome ASN past president and award selection committee chair, Dr. Susan Quaggan. Well, good morning. I am thrilled to present this morning's Lifetime Achievement Awards. First up, we will be presenting the Robert Nairns Award, established in 2006, which honors individuals who have made substantial and meritorious contributions in education and teaching. Teaching is an integral part of what an academic physician does. Bob Nairns has left a long list of legacies for the ASN. Bob was creative and visionary and thought out of the box. The reason why an education award should be given by the society is because it's one of its core missions. Anybody can stand up and teach, but it's a certain talent that certain people have that get it across in a more digestible, more exciting, more animated way. You have to love teaching. That's sort of a given. You have to really know the field. And you have to be able to explain it in a way that people can understand. Bob Nairns early on understood and had a vision to bring to the nephrologist the utmost and in integrated knowledge from basic science to clinical care. He brought fluid and electrolyte teaching into the mainstream so that there were all kinds of people, myself included, who followed after him who might not have been able to do it if he hadn't set the path. Bob Narrens came on as the uh, head of education and he had a lot of really good ideas and he was very aggressive. He certainly will be remembered for the uh, board review course, renal weekends, and NEFSAP. I took a larger view of what was necessary to develop education to its greatest extent. With this award, the American Society of Nephrology is recognizing the contributions of worthy individuals to teaching and education. I thank you all. Bob put education on the map at ASN. His legacy lives on. The American Society of Nephrology presents the 2023 Robert G. Narens Award to Dr. Michael Emmett in recognition of his wide-ranging contributions to teaching and education in nephrology. He is Chairman Emeritus and Senior Advisor in the Department of Internal Medicine at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, and a professor at both Texas A&M Health Science Center and the University of Texas Southwestern. Born in a displaced persons camp to survivors of the Holocaust in Austria, Dr. Emmett and his family immigrated to Pennsylvania in 1949. He spoke only Yiddish and for years struggled academically, but eventually hit his stride at Penn State and then Temple University Medical School, where he graduated first in his class. He took his medical internship and residency at Yale, followed by a nephrology fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania where his research year was supervised by Dr. Narens. Their seminal work on the usefulness of the anion gap in diagnosing and managing acid-base and electrolyte disorders profoundly impacted the field. 
In 1976, Dr. Emmett joined Dallas Nephrology Associates and the faculty at Baylor in Dallas, where he went on to become Chief of Nephrology, Ralph Thompson Professor of Medicine, and Chairperson of the Department of Medicine. He simultaneously participated in the educational programs at UT Southwestern Medical Center and Parkland Health and Hospital System. This led to lifelong collaborations with Drs. Donald Selden and John Fortran, which resulted in clinically important discoveries and numerous articles and textbook chapters that have influenced the care of patients with kidney disease. Dr. Emmett served on the committees writing questions for both the American Board of Internal Medicine's Nephrology Certification Examination and the General Internal Medicine Exam. At the National Kidney Foundation, he developed important educational programs as Vice President for Professional Education. Among his many highly rated visiting professorships and lectureships are multiple presentations at ASN's annual board review course and Kidney Week. Since 2010, he has been an author and editor for the online publication Up to Date. A master of the American College of Physicians, Dr. Emmett has been recognized with multiple teaching awards and other honors throughout his career. He has made a tangible impact on the training of hundreds of nephrology fellows, residents, and students. He and his wife, Rachel, have three children and seven grandchildren. Their favorite pastimes include hiking, traveling, and spending quality time with their extended family in Texas, Georgia, and Philadelphia. With a celebrated career spanning almost five decades, Dr. Michael Emmett has consistently demonstrated his ongoing commitment to the practice of nephrology, nephrology education, and teaching. I am thrilled to present this year's Nairns Award to Dr. Michael Emmett. Thank you so much. First, uh, I want to thank Dr. Quaggan and the awards committee for selecting me for this honor. And next, I want to thank my, my first and most important nephrology mentor, Robert Narens, for whom this Lifetime Teaching Award is named. <clears throat> I'm so lucky to have been given the opportunity <clears throat> to work with Bob and to stand on his very large academic shoulders. He started me on the academic path I've pursued, so thank you, thank you, Bob. I'm sorry that Bob's not here to celebrate with me. Next, of course, I must uh, thank Pavel Garashimek. Uh, Pavel was a very brave Ukrainian Christian who during the Nazi occupation hid my parents and sister for 18 months in a barn at grave moral risk to his entire family. His incredibly brave act is the only reason they survived and I was born, Michal Chomut, in the Binder Michal Displaced Persons Camp in Austria. Th three and a half years later, our family was fortunate to be permitted to immigrate to the United States, but life here was a major struggle. None of us spoke English. I could speak only Yiddish, and we had absolutely no money and nothing of value except our lives and each other. My parents worked seven days a week, and I was largely raised by my sister, Laura, sitting over there. Thank you, Laura, for being my surrogate mother. In elementary school, I was a horrible student, almost all Ds and Fs but gradually we coped and adapted to life in the United States. Academics continued to be a major challenge until I entered Penn State where I hit my academic stride and then I excelled at Temple Medical School. Physiology was especially fascinating and Leroy Shear introduced me to nephrology. Then off to Yale with its strong renal physiology group led by Frank Epstein and Lou Welch. And then in 1974, I was fortunate to be accepted at a powerhouse nephrology empire, the University of Pennsylvania where the faculty included Bud Relman, Sam Thier, Marty Goldberg, Zal Agus, Donna McCurdy, Lee Henderson, Bob Grossman, Askar Rastegar, Donna, uh, Larry Beck, Erwin Singer, Ralph DeFranzo, Stanley Goldfarb, and of course, 
Bob Narens. After a year of clinical fellowship with Mike Rudnick, Gail Morrison, Randy Westby, and Kai Lau, I entered Bob's lab for a research year. Bob was a wonderful mentor and, of course, his dazzling ability to explain things combined with his very unique Borscht Belt humor was an incredible combination, and those attributes were still not well known outside of Philadelphia. We developed new and better ammonia assays, studied renal ammonia genesis, and the acid-base effects of phosphate depletion in rats. But mostly, Bob taught me how to make complicated concepts as simple as possible, how to teach, and how to enjoy and love acid-base and electrolyte physiology. We wrote a paper called The Clinical Use of the Anion Gap, which put us on the international nephrology map. <clears throat> By the way, my name is misspelled on my most impactful paper. I'm referenced as Michael Emmett, M-E, not M-D. One of my former Yale interns, Freddie Schiffman, wrote me a letter saying he had no idea that Penn had granted me a Master of Electrolyte degree. One of my medical school classmates, John, the late John Stokes, was a renal fellow at Southwestern in Dallas, and he told me about a very academic private nephrology group called R.C. Pratty & Associates, which later became Dallas Nephrology Associates. What a stroke of luck for me to move to Dallas. My wife, Rachel, said she had no intention of living in Dallas, and I promised her it would only be for one or at most two years. That was 1976. The group I joined was indeed very academic, but all the academics were done on your own time, nights and weekends after very busy clinical workloads. And that is where I met Dr. Donald Selden, and he became my second academic father. Selden was the most incredibly brilliant individuals I have ever personally known. He liked me, respected me, and changed my life. We worked on manuscripts, chapters, and books in the evenings in his office and during weekends at his home. He would often say to me, Michael, if only you had come to Southwestern for your fellowship, I could have made something out of you. But he tried nevertheless. And my third incredible lifelong teacher and mentor was John Fortran. We completed so many renal GI studies together and developed things like Miralax, Foslo, and Suprep. John has been my teacher and close friend for almost 50 years now. I also must thank my DNA partner, Tom Parker, who created the Winter Nephrology Symposiums and made me an integral part of the faculty to meet so many nephrology giants in both academic and social settings and to ski on the ski slopes with them was phenomenal. Selden, Coco, Giebisch, Alpern, Glassick, Sladopolsky, Turrell, Jacobson, Cameron, Pohl, Steinman, Schreier, Kurtzman, and so many others. And I still meet virtually with some of these great friends every Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. The social events Tom created were unequivocally the life, some of the life's highlights for Rachel and me. I also want to thank a number of previous Narrens Award winners who are some of my biggest supporters, Bill Bennett, Dick Lassick, Mitch Rosner, Joel Koff, Mark Seidel, Stu Linus, and Mark Rosenberg. And a shout out to my former trainees who continue to support me like Andy Fenves, Ankit Mehta, Marty May, Rajiv Agarwal, Bob Hukins, and Hamid Peshai. And Rachel and I grew up in Philadelphia, so we have a large extended family here. So my mishpucha is all sitting up here in the front of the uh, auditorium. So thanks to my Philadelphia relatives and friends who have come here to celebrate with me. And finally, thank you, Rachel, for all your love and support and for putting up with me and my passionate love affair with nephrology. And to my kids, Mira, Daniel, and Joshua, for growing into exemplary adults and producing our seven wonderful grandchildren. And finally, again, thank you, Bob Narens, for guiding me onto a path of academic success and consistently being my strongest and loud loudest academic supporter. Thank you. you go down. Our next award this morning is the Belding Scribner Award. Established in 1995, this award honors individuals who have made outstanding contributions that have a direct impact on the care of persons living with kidney diseases or have substantially changed the practice of nephrology. Colleagues around the world had great respect for Dr. Scribner. Patients who all died now could live. He made a profound difference on the lives of millions of people. Dr. Belding Scribner embodied everything we strive for in clinical research. 
his accomplishment was to change the entire paradigm of end-stage kidney disease into a treatable disease. He woke up one morning with the idea that uh, he should develop a shunt. He connect the high pressure artery with a low pressure vein so that the blood runs through very quickly. In March of 1960, with the Scribner shunt, patients were now able to live. My early dialysis sessions were done in the basement of Eklund Hall, and we would dialyze overnight on the Keel dialyzer. Dr. Scribner was instrumental going back to Washington, D.C. to eventually get funding for end-stage renal disease. It really was a miraculous kind of thing to be able to come and tell the Congress about. We now have the ability to save lives of thousands and thousands of people for whom kidney failure was a death sentence. Belding Scribner was the first chief of nephrology at the University of Washington and also the founder of the Northwest Kidney Centers, a not-for-profit dialysis provider. We now have a kidney research institute, which is doing exciting work to bring advances to the field. Dr. Scribner won the Lasker Award. He impacted medicine in such a profound way. He was a miracle for our patients. Without him, you know, I wouldn't be here. The American Society of Nephrology presents the 2023 Belding H. Scribner Award to Dr. Philip Lee for his contributions to nephrology in the fields of peritoneal dialysis, IgA nephropathy, and integrated care in chronic kidney diseases. He is the Chief of Nephrology and Consultant Physician at the Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. He is also an Honorary Professor of Medicine and Director of the Carol and Richard Yu Peritoneal Dialysis Research Center at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. After obtaining his medical education at University of Hong Kong, Dr. Lee completed his postgraduate training in the United Kingdom and later earned his MD at Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is a fellow of the Hong Kong College of Physicians, the Royal College of Physicians, and the American College of Physicians, among other organizations. Dr. Lee has been working in peritoneal dialysis for over 30 years. Under his leadership, the PD Center at Prince of Wales Hospital has developed many quality programs and a comprehensive integrated care model that includes early referral for end-stage renal disease, pre-dialysis education, and PD training of patients, relatives, and healthcare workers. At the PD Research Center, he oversees multiple studies in clinical and basic science, including studies on PD epidemiology and dialysis economics, preservation of renal function, and many others. His publications include several landmark randomized controlled trials on PD, such as evaluation of double bag systems and use of glucose-sparing solutions. His leadership in developing the globally used PD peritonitis management guidelines and as a strong proponent for PD First policy has significant worldwide impact. He has also published many clinical trials on IgA nephropathy, including landmark RCTs on the use of angiotensin II receptor blockers, as well as the use of ACE inhibitors in early treatment. Dr. Lee has authored more than 580 original and review articles in peer-reviewed journals, five books, and 22 book chapters. He has been a visiting professor and scholar at several leading universities around the world and has given lectures at more than 250 international congresses and meetings. As a global leader in nephrology, he has served as president of the International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis and the Asian Pacific Society of Nephrology, among many other positions. He has chaired and worked on organizing committees for numerous nephrology meetings, including the World Congress of Nephrology and ASN Kidney Week. In recognition of his many accomplishments, Dr. Lee has received prestigious awards from APSN, ISPD, the National Kidney Foundation, and several other organizations. With the support of his wife Lucinda and their family, along with friends and colleagues across the globe, 
Dr. Philip Lee has demonstrated a lifelong commitment to improving the care of kidney patients and advancing the science of nephrology. I'm thrilled to announce the winner of this year's Belding Scribner Award is Dr. Philip Lee. Professor Josephson, Professor Quagwin, colleagues, friends of ASN. It's really my great honor to be the recipient of the 2023 ASN Belgium Scribner Award. I would like to thank Professor Joe Boventure of Harvard and my other international nephrology friends and collaborators for the nomination. And I thank the American Society of Nephrology and the Award Selection Committee for honoring me with this very prestigious award. Professor Beldin Scribner is one of the most respected nephrologists of myself. Though I never had a chance to personally know him, the name Scribner Shunt is probably the first thing I learned as a young fellow in nephrology. Professor Scribner's huge contribution to science of nephrology and to American and global nephrology is incontestable. I'm honored and at the same time humbled to receive this award and join the very distinguished nephrologist scientists who received this award since 1995. Actually, the award belongs to my whole Winnow team in Prince of Wales Hospital, Chinese University of Hong Kong, many of whom are in the audience. I have to thank all of them for doing such a great basic and clinical research in nephrology, in particular, in areas of peritoneal dialysis, IJ nephropathy, and integrated CKD care. My work for PD and the promotion for PD first policy around the world has always been dear to my heart, and I will continue to support home dialysis, including PD and home hemodialysis, as the most favored mode for kidney replacement therapies. It is interesting to see. From 1995 to 1998, the recipients of early years of the Scribner Award are actually pioneers and giants in peritoneal dialysis. Robert Popovich, Jack Moncrief, Frank Gotch, Carl North, and Dimitrios Oriopoulos. I'm prudent to say, from 1999 to 2022, the major works of the recipients of the Scribner Award are not focused in PD. It is really great for myself to be honored with this award to signify the importance of PD as recognized by ASN. I'm also particularly honored to be the first Chinese and the first working in Asia to receive this award. I have to thank Professor Richard Yu for his continued support to me and in setting up the Carol and Richard Yu Research Center in PD in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, of which I'm the founding director. The support to me from the Hong Kong and Chinese Reno community is greatly appreciated. My successive presidencies of International Society for Peritoneal Dialysis, Asian Pacific Society of Nephrology, and International Association of Chinese Nephrologists have helped me with my various endeavors and programs aiming to benefit kidney patients around the world. I would like to thank my wife, Lucinda, who has given me tremendous encouragement towards my work throughout these years. I'm from a grassroots family, and my parents, both deceased, would have been very proud of me today. This is a Lifetime Achievement Award of ASN for me, and at the same time, I enjoy my lifetime clinical and research work in nephrology, through which I'm fortunate enough to have acquainted with a great number of very good friends in the international renal community around the world. For the younger generation, 
my advice to you is nephrology is fun. Once again, thank you all and my best wishes. In 1964, the Homer Smith Lifetime Achievement Award was established to honor an individual whose contributions have fundamentally changed the science of nephrology. Homer Smith was a visionary. He was curious. He was innovative. He was foundational to modern nephrology. The Homer Smith Award of the American Society of Nephrology was the first award given, and it reflects Homer Smith's dominant role in understanding the physiology of the kidney. Smith led the Department of Physiology for decades at NYU, and it was Smith, probably more than any other person, who defined the modern concepts of glomerular filtration, tubular excretion, and also secretion. Homer Smith truly inspired generations of physicians, including my own. He brought to nephrology uh, principles upon which our field is based. All of these basic things inform our care of patients. He used comparative biology in order to advance our understanding of more complex systems, the human kidney. He brought to NYU techniques and information that he had gathered by studying fish. Many of those experiments were carried out on Mount Desert Island. The Mount Desert Island Biological Lab played an extraordinary central role. Smith realized that marine organisms gave him powerful tools to study the evolution of the kidney. He was into philosophy, music, science in the broadest sense, religion. To read him, it sort of opens your mind to other areas and it fires the imagination. When he said something, it turned out to be correct because he was very precise in what he did. And that's a lesson for all of us. He really set the stage for all future researchers and how to move the field forward. The American Society of Nephrology presents the 2023 Homer W. Smith Award to Dr. Ali Garavi for his exceptional contributions to the field of genomic nephrology. He is the J. Meltzer Professor of Nephrology and Hypertension at Columbia University in New York City. Currently, he also serves as Chief of Nephrology, Director of the Center for Precision Medicine and Genomics in the Department of Medicine and Interim Chair of the Department of Medicine. After receiving his medical degree from George Washington University, Dr. Garavi completed residency in internal medicine and fellowships in hypertension and nephrology at the Mount Sinai Medical Center. He then completed a postdoctoral fellowship in human genetics at Yale University and joined Columbia University in 2003. Dr. Garavi's research is focused on the molecular genetics of kidney diseases. His work has led to the discovery of genes and loci for IgA nephropathy and congenital defects of the kidney and urinary tract. The Garavi lab has also demonstrated the utility of clinical sequencing in the diagnosis and management of patients with kidney disease, and they are now extending this work to other adult constitutional disorders. Dr. Garavi's goal is to bring personalized genomic medicine from the laboratory into patient care. He is the principal investigator of multiple scientific projects funded by the National Institutes of Health, including the All of Us Grant, the National Precision Medicine Initiative. Through this work, he has also mentored many physicians and scientists who now have independent research programs in the field of precision medicine and genomic nephrology. Dr. Garavi has authored or contributed to more than 160 publications on the genetics of kidney disease. His studies have clarified basic pathophysiology and influenced clinical practice across multiple areas. He has given invited lectures at numerous leading universities and meetings around the world and has led committees related to genetic testing in nephrology for several national and international organizations. 
He is an associate editor for Jason and has served on the editorial boards of several other scientific journals. An elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians, Dr. Garavi has received other distinguished honors, including the Judson Dayland Prize for Outstanding Clinical Investigation from the American Philosophical Society, the National Medical Award from the Kidney and Urology Foundation of America, and the Mentor of the Year Award at Columbia. Dr. Ali Garavi is recognized by colleagues across the globe as an exemplary physician scientist whose work has significantly enhanced our understanding and treatment of kidney diseases and continues to have important implications for the future of nephrology. I'm thrilled to announce the awardee of this year's Homer Smith Award is Dr. Ali Garavi, who will now present on nephrology practice and therapeutics through a genomic lens. Thank you very much for this wonderful uh, honor. Uh, it's really great to be here to talk to you today about uh, genomic medicine, something that I've been working involved in for the past 30 years. And uh, I um, wanted to start by so I have some disclosures, um, but my main disclosure here today is that uh, um, I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, for this award, and uh, we, it, my work depends on a lot of collaborations. Uh, I have got to receive a lot of mentorship over the years, uh, and I'm, it's going to take a little bit of time to go through this, and I might speak a little bit fast, uh, but I'm from New York, so what do you, <laughs> what do you expect? So I'm going to uh, anchor this talk based on uh, some advice that I received from my colleague and friend, uh, Andrew Bomback, as we were trying to put together uh, the study for CureGN, which is longitudinal, longitudinal study of patients with primary glomerular diseases. And Andy advised us to anchor the aims of the study on four essential questions that patients have when you come to see them. Uh, we, uh, and the qu patient's questions are, what is this disease? Why do I have this disease? What will happen to me? And what are the treatment options that are available? And essentially, every physician or a scientist who's working on a problem will try to answer some of these questions through their knowledge and their, their, uh, their endeavor. Uh, one of the newer twists on this is whether the patients will come to you nowadays and ask, doctor, should we perform genome sequencing to answer some of these questions? And so I think with the introduction of genomics, I think many physicians, including nephrologists, have the opportunity to incorporate genomic nephrology into their practice. So I wish I was as clever as Andy and thoughtful as him when I was uh, training to come up with a set of very good questions. I just realized sometime during my residency as I was finishing it that we were treating the patients the same way, uh, even though their presentation, the clinical course, and their response to treatment really varied. And that led me to, of course, to think about research as a way of trying to find new knowledge to be able to, you know, to alter practice. But I really didn't know uh, where to go, and I was very lucky that at the time at the Mount Sinai Medical Center, I met Robert Phillips, uh, who's a molecular cardiologist who then started doing clinical trials in hypertension, and he had a fellowship in hypertension, and he offered me a position for me to work with him. And I managed to spend three really outstanding years with him uh, doing clinical trials, learning about you know, the clinical practice, but also, uh, you know, he allowed me to explore many different areas uh, in, in thinking about the pathogenesis of hypertension. And at the time, the first genomic maps were becoming available, the New England Genome Project's underway, and he suggested that maybe I should go to the lab and start to test some polymorphism associations with hypertension. So he introduced me to Mike Lipkowitz, who, uh, who is a nephrologist uh, at Mount Sinai. Mike taught me how to do my first PCR. We started doing association studies of hypertension and dabbling in this. This was the time when we were doing one SNP at a time. Um, and I was also very lucky that at the time, Barry Kohler became a chair of medicine. He had realized the dream of precision medicine back in 1993 by finding uh, the, the mutation that causes a bleeding disorder, uh, found that it's a platelet receptor, and found the 
developed monoclonal antibodies to the receptor, which became the anticoagulation therapy to prevent restenosis for uh, angioplasty and uh, stent placement. And so his discovery for these rare diseases led to you know, treatment for millions of people. At the same time, Ruth Abramson, uh, who I met in nephrology, who became our fellowship director, uh, gave, gave me a lot of advice and mentoring, and she's probably the toughest and most generous person I've ever met in my, uh, in my, in my lifetime. And I always think about Ruth when I have to make diff difficult decisions. So during that time, Paul Klotman joined uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center uh, and became the division director and completely transformed the division. He's, high, he's a highly regular scientist, um, really dedicated to basic sciences, discovery, and academic medicine, and fostering the careers of physicians. And he took me under his wing and convinced me to work with him, but also you know, develop my skills in uh, human genetics. And so uh, he advised me to continue working on it, but sent me to Yale University. He advised me to go work with Rick Lifton, who was developing an incredible program in human genetics. And Paul sponsored me to go to Rick's lab at Yale to learn about genetics and really do my apprenticeship there. And Rick was a formidable mentor. Uh, he is a former recipient of this award. And he you know, was generous, but highly rigorous. And to me, he taught me how to think through problems uh, in a very detailed way. Uh, he also gave me freedom to think about problems and essentially assigned me to think about the problem that I wanted to work on, something that would, have, that would be important that has long-term traction. And so that's what really many of the work that I wound up working on in the, in the next 25 years uh, were initiated during this period of incubation in Rick's lab. And despite being you know, a very you know, a highly productive lab, we also had a lot of fun, as you can see in this slide. We were able to uh, uh, celebrate Halloween with Adam's uh, family theme, and there were regular uh, group meetings together to, uh, to, to really enjoy and interact and have fun together. So and, and it was an incredibly you know, uh, smart group of people uh, in the lab that we pushed each other and really encouraged each other to succeed. And this was a really wonderful time. So at the same time, Steve Salmdo uh, joined as chief of nephrology uh, at uh, Yale University. And Steve, um, you know, whether he liked it or not, became my mentor. And, and, I, and I really relied on his uh, advice up to this day for many, many, many uh, subtopics of science, medicine, uh, administration, and, and so forth. Peter Aronson was also highly supportive at the time. And you can see there's an incredible uh, group of people uh, here, former uh, Omer Smith awardees with Salmdo, Lifton, Aronson, Bullpap, and Gibish, who really provided a vibrant uh, environment uh, for me to think about problems. Um, so at the same time, when, as I was thinking about which problems to study, it struck me back in 1997 that there are some problems that we don't really understand, which are developmental disorders of the kidney and immune-mediated diseases of the kidney. And maybe human genetics would be a good way to get things started. And these are the two disorders that I started thinking about, try to go about finding cases and families to be able to do the human genetic studies. And at the time, we had linkage uh, uh, analysis available, for those of you who remember this. Uh, and the, the idea was to essentially identify a, a region in the genome which imparted such a large effect in, in these families uh, that you would uh, be able to positionally clone a gene. Well, in thinking about these problems in retrospect, um, this was a really optimistic finding. I was uh, very naive, and sometimes I guess it's better to be naive than to be really an expert on some things, because that really led me into thinking about IG nephropathy quite a bit, even though it has complex determination. And in fact, what we know now is that it's determined by the combined effect of multiple alleles, which have a small effect. And I really had no hope of being able to find a monogenic form of disease at the time, losing the linkage approaches. But really made me think through these problems and develop resources and collaborations that enabled me to be successful and our group to be successful in the long term. Uh, this happened because as I was reading the literature, I realized that Bruce Julian and Robert Wyatt uh, in eastern Kentucky had made the observation that there was a really high aggregation of IgA nephropathy in certain regions of eastern Kentucky, and they did really detailed genealogical studies demonstrating that these, all these individuals here in black who have IgA nephropathy were, can be related back to five common ancestors going seven to eight generations back, demonstrating an inherited mechanism. And this started a collaboration with Jan Novak, looking at the molecular pathogenesis and the immunology of IgA nephropathy. And these collaborations continue to this day. 
uh, simultaneously in northern Italy, Francesco Scolari had made similar observations and together with Claudio Izzi had identified villages in northern Italy in which there was tremendous aggregation again of immune mediated disorders. And again, as you can see, these large extended pedigrees going back to multiple generations but to a common ancestor, again suggesting an inherited mechanism and, uh, and, and the possibility of engaging in identifying underlying genes. And so this led to the development of a collaboration that, uh, that existed this day and a network of, cl of clinicians that we worked together to answer some of these questions related to kidney disease, IG nephropathy, and congenital defects. Um, I also got a lot of collaborations and help over the years from colleagues in uh, East Asia, Hong Zong, Nang Chen, and Jing Wang Xie, introduced to me by uh, Si Jiang He, uh, were really critical partners in being able to carry out the work, and I'm very grateful for these collaborations. So in 2003, I was you know, finishing five years in Rick's lab, and I, Kai Salakadi, who was at the time the division director uh, at Columbia, offered me a job to, be a, uh, uh, to have an independent lab. And I was very lucky that you know, he, 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 uh, he thought about me, and I took, I took the position because there was a lot of interest in glomerular diseases at Columbia. And then soon after, Don Landry became the division director, and subsequently the department chair, and really was highly supportive in you know, getting me started. Uh, we had a small lab in 2004. I was I was lucky that Simon Sanokerki really soon joined my lab and he's become a real anchor and then you know, has his own independent program that's how it's successful in 2006, 2007. Christoph Kirlock joined the lab and again has been the driving force for making progress for IG and nephropathy. Subsequently, Nick Sears, Hila Rasuli, Miguel Ferbetsky all joined the lab. And all the work I'm going to tell you about has been the contribution of, you know, of all these folks who really worked hard to drive the science forward. And this is what we look like. Uh, and so I'm really going to, uh, all the work that I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is really attributable to the effort, tireless efforts of all these individuals here. So let's go back to Andy's questions. How should we perform genome sequencing to answer some of these questions? And so the human genome, the, completed, uh, the sequence was completed uh, in 2021. There are three billion nucleotides. And DNA sequencers are, are now able to sequence entire human genomes in 24 hours for a few hundred dollars. So we've sequenced now hundreds of thousands of millions of individuals globally. And but very earlier on, the, the clinical implications of this uh, genomic technology was evident for clinical medicine and for clinical genetics. And there were a series of papers that were published demonstrating the utility for diagnosing rare monogenic disorders, typically in the neurodevelopmental field, in, in the pediatric field, as well as in cancer. And cancer has really adopted genomics to a large extent nowadays, such to the point that there are no clinical trials that go forward without some form of genomic uh, profiling done. And a lot of clinical practice now has integrated genomic profiling into its, uh, into its practice. And so this is the opportunity that we have in in nephrology, I think, to be able to really advance the care of our patients by integrating genomics into clinical care. So an example I'm going to give you are two, two case studies really earlier on that uh, really clarified to me how we can the impact of genomics into clinical care. This is a 20-year-old who was admitted after a suicide attempt and had a history of poor learning, dropped out of school at age 16, and had a history of solitary kidney. His mother always thought that somehow these two issues, the neuro neurocognitive issues as well as the solitary kidney were uh, related, but was told that they're, in fact they're not related for about most of, the, most of the, the patient's lifetime. This is the second patient we saw in our clinic, a 64-year-old woman who was referred to hypomagnesemia, had numerous cysts in both kidneys, Renal function was okay, but she'd had diabetes for 20 years. She had infertility due to uterine malformations, also had a history of poor learning. She always said, whenever I, whenever I go see a doctor to tell me something new that's wrong with me, I'm just unlucky that way. Well, it turns out that both of these patients have the same uh, genetic problem. They have a deletion on chromosome 17Q12 that was describable by macroarray technology. So it's a, about a 1 million base pair deletion of one section of chromosome 17Q, which takes out a transcription factor called HNF1 beta, responsible or, uh, for kidney development and pancreatic development. And the patients with this syndrome, also called renal cyst and uh, diabetes syndrome, are typically born with kidney malformations, uh, but also cystic diseases that sometimes mimic polycystic kidney disease. They have hypomagnesemia due to tubulopathies. They have uh, gout. 
Um, they also develop diabetes because the HNF1 beta is really important for pancreatic development. And so this multitude and, and uh, GU abnormalities in, in women. So this multitude of abnormalities can be all attributed to a single uh, genetic event. And so we were able to explain to these patients that all of these findings are related, and it's not as due to a succession of unlucky events. And this had a lot of implications for, for the patients to understand what was going on with them, and a lot of relief to get clarification. So, and the importance of providing a diagnosis, I cannot emphasize enough. As Andy reminded us, this is the first thing that patients want to know about. In addition, this has implications for follow-up and, uh, and understanding complications for these patients. For example, the risk of diabetes occurs sometimes in patients in their 20s and 30s, so you can advise them earlier on about you know, healthy uh, diet, uh, and if they need to be trans transplanted because of their kidney problem, we have to think about steroid sp uh, sparing regimens to be able to reduce the risk of unmasking diabetes. Well, it turns out this is not the only genetic syndrome that uh, we can uncover, uncover in patients who have kidney malformations or CKD. This is, there's a list of 45, at least 45 different genomic disorders, deletions of duplications of the genome that one can detect if you start screening uh, patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. We've now looked at over 7,000 individuals who have CKD, many of them with congenital defects, as many of them just with CKD. And Simone Sanakirke has really spearheaded this work and has taken it you know, to, to really a, a, an amazing uh, level. But it turns out that the most important thing that I learned about this thing, this slide, is that you have, this is the, this is the you see the map of the chromosomes uh, in, in the this, in this rectangles here are the deletions and duplications. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot of heterogeneity. These individuals who present in the same way, in a very similar way, actually have genetic lesions that are very different. And they may also have um, distinct complications that that, uh, that manifest over the years. So this, there's a real uh, opportunity for personalizing care, explaining what's going on to patients, uh, as well as risk stratifying them for the future. So this, this initial study that we wind up doing um, uh, told me that there's a real, uh, real opportunity for introducing genomics to make a precise diagnosis, uh, predicting complications, uh, and trying to risk stratify patients for future therapy. Uh, We've taken this further now to think about now sequencing, looking not just at the deletions and duplications in the genome, but at single nucleotide changes. Um, and we wound up doing this study a few years ago, led by Emily Groupman, uh, where we had nearly 3,300 patients that we'd wind up doing exome sequencing. This is code, uh, sequencing the coding portion of the genome. Uh, and we realized that there's a diagnostic rate of 9.3%. So almost one in 10 patients, we can provide a, a diagnosis for a monogenic form of disease. And these mutations, um, they were you know, distributed across 66 different genes. There were six genes which accounted for two-thirds of the cases, so PKD1, PKD2, type 4 collagen genes, uromodulin. But the other remaining genes were in, identified in one or two individuals at a time. Most of these diagnoses were not made by, uh, in the clinical setting based on the standard clinical workup. This is another way of showing the same data where you have uh, the, the common or the most common mutations that are identified. And then you could see this long tail of uh, a variants identified in one or two individuals each. And so even though this is, represents you know, individually a few patients, altogether, this is actually a significant number of patients. And so if you think about, you know, this is the number of cases that we identified, looking at 3,000 cases, think about the total number of CKD patients that we have evaluated in, in, in this room by all the nephrologists here, and the opportunity to providing care for these patients uh, by providing a, a real uh, a, a genetic diagnosis and a precise diagnosis. Moreover, most of these disorders are thought to be rare, and so as a result, um, they're, they're, most of the time they were deemed not to have enough clinical power or enough patients to be able to do clinical trials. By doing sequencing and identifying these patients uh, and identifying how many patients have these rare disorders, I think there's a real opportunity now to think about clinical trials with these patients, getting interest from uh, biotech and pharma to pay attention to these disorders and think about developing treatment for these, uh, for these rare uh, kidney disorders that we encounter in clinical practice. So, we also thought about how to return these genetic results, and Jordan Nestor wound up taking uh, the lead on this uh, in our clinics and developed a workflow for returning initially research results 
uh, she identified 20 different barriers for uh, implementing the return of results to patients, and we sort of tried to address each one of them and eventually set up the, uh, a kidney genetics clinic at Columbia. We just wrote about it. Uh, we launched during the pandemic, in fact, and you could see the volume really increased with uh, nephrogenetics consultations that occur virtually. And it's interesting that we even saw, started to see a dip in uh, referrals over the years because uh, many clinicians at our medical centers started to get very comfortable with genetic testing, and as a result, they weren't referring to genetic uh, cl uh, clinic anymore. They were able to handle the, uh, the information uh, all by themselves. Um, Hila Rasuli has, uh, in order to really inc improve uh, uh, you know, the uh, dissemination of genetic uh, uh, testing across uh, the nephrology community, has started to look at this issue of return of results and assessing genetic literacy by a number of studies by developing a genetic literacy test, te uh, uh, inquiring about uh, nephrology education and how do we do, do better in terms of our training programs to improve uh, genomic uh, education. And, and so I think that this creates real opportunities opportunities for us to integrate this into our uh, clinics, but as well into our, into our training programs to bring nephrology to the genomic era. So some of the opportunities that we have in front of us is to really solve CKD of unknown cause. Uh, there's a prevalence of 9.1% globally, uh, but depending on the registries you look at and how you define CKD of unknown cause, it may account for up to 20% of patients. And if you do exome sequencing, there's a diagnostic rate of almost one in five. So there's a real opportunity for us to provide a diagnosis to patients who present too late or for whom a clinical armamentarium, a standard approach, doesn't work. So I think that's a real progress that we can make in by incorporating genomic medicine. And so here's a shout out to the Clean Gen uh, Kidney Disease Work Group, which is really working. Uh, this is a group of 63 medical centers, 120 investigators that are trying to develop a catalog of monogenic kidney disorders and develop, uh, you know, actionable, defining actionable uh, genetic mutations. Uh, and so a real shout out to this group that's doing a really hard work to be able to integrate genomic medicine and help us develop a catalog of genomic variants and uh, ge uh, genetic diseases of the kidney. Um, the other opportunity we have is for risk stratification. The patients want to know what will happen to me. Well, so it turns out that we've looked at this now in about uh, nearly 6,000 adults and children with chronic kidney disease and looked at how many have a monogenic disease and looked at their long-term trajectory in the QRGN study and two cohorts from Columbia. And it turns out that patients who have a monogenic form of kidney disease actually have a two to three-fold higher risk of developing kidney failure in the ensuing years. And we're not sure exactly why that is. It might be that they're less responsive to treatment. It may be that there's a burden of genetic defect that occurs at birth, essentially, the long-term burden uh, really is the, the reason why they progress faster. But this is, this is a real opportunity, again, to risk stratify our patients. And also think about this in terms of clinical trials, because this is a group of patients who will behave differently and will have different outcomes. So having some genomic stratifications in our clinical trials might help us discern signal a lot better. And similarly, there's a signal even for mortality. Miguel Verbetsky, looking at the Crick study, looking at CNVs, these copy number disorders, show that these PCNV carriers also have a higher mortality rate. Again, a really relevant outcomes for clinical trials. And again, the risk stratification may be able to help us in terms of discerning signal for, uh, for our therapeutics. We want to change CKD management as well. So the question is not only do we want to make a diagnosis, but also want to do, see if there's a change in management. And so we just completed the study in collaboration with Natera, where there were 1,600 patients that were enrolled into a panel sequencing uh, in a protocol across 31 different medical centers. And the diagnostic rate was about 21%. But really importantly, we had uh, questionnaires in the pre-test and the post-test period from physicians. And in 30% of the cases where there was a positive diagnosis, there was a change in treatment plan. And in 90% of the cases, there was some impact on clinical management, such as family planning, referral to genetic testing, and providing uh, uh, information for at-risk family members. And this is the kind of information that we need on impact on management that's going to be really necessary for us to adopt this faster and also get insurers to pay attention to reimbursing genetic testing more uh, widely. We have many. <coughs> examples of monogenic kidney diseases for which we have specific therapies. Uh, some examples are here for Little syndrome and amyloride, for example, or Fabry's disease for uh, enzyme replacement therapy. We have RNAi therapy that was recently introduced for primary hypoluxuria. And then we have exciting clinical trials that are you know, uh, targeting genetic diseases. 
The best example that we have that's ongoing right now is looking at APOL1 uh, risk alleles. And so, you know, this, this gene, this locus was initially identified uh, by the FINE consortium uh, and uh, Jeff Kopp and Cheryl Winkler looking at FSGS. Uh, and then subsequently, Martin Pollock identified APOL1 as the, the culprit gene. And then now we have clinical trials 10 years later uh, with small molecular inhibitors that show promising results. So I think this would be, if successful, the first example of genotype-driven therapy therapy that we have in nephrology, just like we have in cancer. And so this is, uh, I think, at the beginning of a new era for us to develop new therapies for our disorders uh, of interest that we see every day. There are a lot of information in the genome uh, that's independent of the clinical diagnosis. Our patients have a lot of comorbidities, cardiovascular disease, cancer, infection, and thrombotic complications. And there are monogenic forms of each one of these complications. And each one of these monogenic forms individually is rare, but in the aggregate, they account for about 10% of the population. And so, again, there's a, there's a real opportunity for introducing genomic medicine, even for patients who don't have a genetic form of kidney disease, to be able to understand some of the future comorbidities and tailor treatment. And for example, many of our patients are at risk of developing cancer uh, because of immunosuppressive therapy or erythropoietin. And if they already have a genetic form of uh, predisposition to cancer, then maybe we should think about our therapies a little bit differently and personalize our care uh, for, the, for these patients, but using steroid sparing regimens, for example. And then we have a lot of opportunity for understanding complex disorders. So going back to this issue of IgA nephropathy, it has complex determination. And the work really led by Christoph Kurlock has highlighted a number of like, dissected pathways for IgA nephropathy. His group has done a GWAS for IgA levels in the general population, it's not patients with IgA nephropathy, in the general population, and identified many signals for uh, the variation in IgA levels. So, but only a subset of these, the ones with the, with the uh, stars here, uh, are also implicated in a genetic associations with IgA nephropathy. So this really tells us that there's an association and a correlation between regulation of IgA levels and the development of IgA nephropathy, but not every single and not every single locus is actually uh, correlated. And so when you're thinking about therapies that may be targeting IgA levels, it's going to be very important to think about those pathways that influence both IgA levels and the risk of IgA nephropathy because some of the other pathways may be completely irrelevant then in the development of disease. And then most recently, uh, completed a GWAS in over 40,000 individuals identifying novel loci. And the incorporation of all this genomic information enables us to start to risk stratify our patients. So patients who are in the top tercile for the polygenic score for IgA nephropathy have a much higher chance of developing kidney failure. And so incorporating genomic information with other clinical information is going to be really important to be able to see outcomes uh, in our patients. And then finally, there's an opportunity for using this information to think about new therapies and new therapeutic targets. And so we wind up putting this list together of loci, the likely culprit, uh, uh, culprit genes, as well as pathways, and then available drugs that might be available to target these pathways. And there's a, there's a long list that we uh, you know, wind up uh, putting together. The good news is that there are multiple trials already going on uh, 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 targeting some of these pathways in IgA nephropathy. I, I'd like to think that some of them were motivated by the genetic data that we have published over the years. Um, and it's known that you know, drug targets that are supported by genetic evidence are much more likely to make it through that pathway and eventually be approved. So I think there's a huge opportunity to use this type of information to think about readapting and repurposing drugs for patients uh, with uh, kidney disease. So I think the current paradigm is to use the patient to see a physician, a workup is done, and maybe somebody thinks about, they think about genetic testing and come up with a plan. In the future, I think we're going to be able to adopt genomic medicine so that the patient is, you know, the genomic sequencing is done at the outset, uh, and then the physician evaluates the patient and the genome and does the genome-targeted workup to come up with a plan. And I think that would really look forward to the future where we incorporate this in every genomic, uh, in every uh, nephrological evaluation uh, as, uh, as we go forward. So I have a large number of people to thank. The Columbia Division of Nephrology has been unbelievable. My colleagues are amazing people to work with, and uh, it's a pleasure to work with them every day, as well as our colleagues in uh, kidney and renal pathology.
uh, have a large number of colleagues and collaborators, consortia uh, to thank. This has been a multidisciplinary effort across, um, across the world. And these are, again, many, many colleagues who have uh, collaborated, contributed uh, samples, uh, clinical data, and in genetic expertise uh, across the world. And last but not least, uh, our, um, our funders uh, across, the, uh, across many different uh, you know, areas, especially the NIH and NIDDK. And uh, my wife, Farah, who's been a you know, supporter of uh, all these years uh, through thick and thin. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I'm Diane McKay, and I have the honor of serving as co-chair for the Kidney Week 2023 with Mark Parazella. Uh, today, we're in for a real treat as we delve into the state-of-the-art lecture presented by Dr. Aria, Erica Ullman Sapphire, currently holding the esteemed position of president, CEO, and professor at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology in California. Dr. Sapphire is at the forefront of innovative research uncovering immune origins of human disease. Under her visionary leadership, she created and led the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Consortium, a global team of leading physicians and scientists spanning four continents. Their united goal, to pioneer groundbreaking antibody, antibody, antibody therapeutics against some of the world's most deadly viral hemorrhagic fevers. Much of Dr. Sapphire's seminal research has been done right on the front lines in West Africa, where she was the first to discover the structure of the Ebola virus surface glycoprotein, a discovery that was instrumental for informing how to target the vulnerabilities of viral proteins, subsequently informing the design of vaccines and therapeutic antibodies for hemorrhagic fever viruses like Ebola, Lassa, Sudan, and Marburg. Her studies have unveiled intricate mechanisms by which viral matrix proteins manipulate host components, showcasing the dynamic adaptability of these pathogens. The significance of Dr. Sapphire's contributions have not gone unnoticed. She's been honored at the White House with a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers and a Global Viral Networks Gallo Award for Scientific Excellence and Leadership. She has received numerous young investigator accolades from various esteemed organizations and garnered numerous awards, including a Fulbright for extensive research across the UK, South Africa, and Germany. She was named director of the Coronavirus Immunotherapy Consortium, an international effort to evaluate human antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. Her lab also led research into COVID-19 mutations with scientists at the Los Alamos National Laboratory and furthermore, Arcus Foundation recently celebrated her exceptional work by naming her Scientist of the Year. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Dr. Erica Olmos sapphire It is lovely to see you all here this morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am inspired by being, that beach ball of death looks very concerning. We'll see if the slides work. I am inspired by being in Philadelphia, the birthplace of our democracy and the concept of 13 separate colonies with different interests becoming one nation. And that's been sort of the focus of my career is how to align opposing labs and competitors in order to achieve something greater than the different individual vectors, if not aligned with by themselves. So I'm going to go through. I am going nowhere because we are frozen. AB, do you want to switch to the slides you have on backup?
Close clip. Closing and reopening. HDMI in first. Okay. And now for my next trick. Okay, so the idea about why you would want to align different labs going in different directions came from this situation. So I spent my life working in global health and emerging infectious diseases. It, it turns out viruses circle the globe rather quickly, which is what we always thought. <laughs> My academic specialty is structural biology. We do x-ray crystallography, we do cryo-electron microscopy. And so for the first 10 years of my career, my laboratory had done work like this, solving the structures of the surface proteins of viruses and human antibodies from survivors trying to figure out how the antibody response would recognize and inactivate these different viruses. And we really thought that if we understood the structures by which the immune system would defeat a virus, we could map how we might make a vaccine and understand how we might make therapeutics. Because you can use these antibodies also as direct drugs or therapeutics for someone that hasn't been vaccinated yet. You know, the example is rabies immunoglobulin, you can deliver, or, or uh, snake bite anti-venom, you deliver antibody to neutralize a toxin or neutralize a virus. So for people that haven't been vaccinated or for when vaccines aren't available yet, you can deliver these antibodies as immediate therapeutics. And that was what we had hoped to do for a lot of these new emerging diseases where there weren't vaccines yet. But my field had reached an impasse, and this is about a, a year before the large Ebola virus outbreak where together, as an entire research field, we had come up with antibodies, and I'm showing you some structures here, that looked sensational in the laboratory, but didn't protect the living things, the non-human primates all died, and other antibodies that would protect the non-human primates from a thousand times the lethal dose of Ebola virus, but didn't look at all interesting in any kind of cell culture assay. So clearly, we were missing things. On a very simplistic level, we had things that worked in test tubes and not in living things, and other things that worked in living things and not in test tubes. So whatever it was we were doing in cell culture in the laboratory clearly was missing something important. Either these results were telling us we needed a cocktail instead of a monotherapy, or they're telling us there's something we were missing about the FC, or they're telling us that the neutralization assays we were using weren't right, or we weren't doing them in the right way. Either way, we needed to figure it out quickly and we needed to work together to do it. So the trouble with global health is that it's remarkably underfunded. We had uh, you know, a handful of molecules that had gone somewhat through the process. Maybe we hadn't looked at enough. Maybe we had found the exceptions and not the rule. Somehow we needed to figure out together what it was that could protect living things from viruses like Ebola and we needed a statistically significant pool of samples to do that. And that was really the fundamental problem. We needed to find some way of working together. We clearly needed much better tools. We needed more samples. And the trouble was every laboratory was working in a silo. And at that point, Ebola virus had, instead of being in small remote villages, had gone into urban centers. And cases were doubling every you know, week or two. So it was starting to look like it was going to be an escalating pandemic. Rapidly, we needed to figure out a research framework that would enable the collaboration we knew we needed. We needed to put together more antibodies and more pool, and a larger pool to figure out what would work. We needed to do different kinds of experiments to figure out what were the things that would show us where in vivo protection came from. We needed to share samples and data but we had to do it within an academic enterprise that was fundamentally built on competition. You know, there's a lot of good things about competition. It drives us to get our results faster. It drives you to do a better job. Um, competition drives innovation. But it can also impede sharing of data and samples, especially unpublished data or samples with intellectual property in them. 
even if you know you need to share your unpublished results, you don't have incentives to do that, right? It's publish or perish. You don't want to get scooped. Even if you wanted to share your samples, maybe your university won't let you until you finish the MTA, and maybe that's a year-long process, and by that point, you know, maybe the point is moot. And so we needed to find ways that would enable us to build a greater body of data and share the pieces of information within a, a, a research framework and an academic enterprise that was fundamentally built on incentives of keeping your data to yourself until the last possible minute. How are we going to do that? Well, we worked together across the field to figure out how to do a study in that way. Now, part of the issue was that different labs in the fields were focusing on different aspects of antibodies. There were camps that said it was mechanical neutralization. There were camps that was said it was the ability of the antibody to recruit FC protection. And they would fight over what was the right mechanism of protection. And the answer was maybe it was all of them to some degree or different antibodies and different features in different places. We needed to do some kind of larger comprehensive study that would bring in all of the voices in the field so that you know, this expert's samples and his voice and his expertise was included, and this expert's sample of voice and expertise was well included. We needed to find some way for all of these competing laboratories, many of whom hated each other's guts, to work together. And what we decided to do was put everybody's antibodies in the field into one big pool, but to blind them all and give them all code names. And that meant that we could study everybody's antibody, but we would only know it as sample 46 or sample 38. And the owner of that antibody was free to go and do all of his research and publish his papers unfettered. We also had really good agreements to protect everybody's intellectual property. If we all together agreed that such and such was the best antibody, well, this is good for the owner. And we also solved another problem, that if we knew in the face of an escalating pandemic we needed rapid answers, the time it takes to form a large consortium and negotiate all these agreements can be slow. How are we going to outpace a pandemic while trying to do a larger, more comprehensive study? We did kind of a tortoise and hare strategy of, you know, a, a good idea and a proof of concept running quickly with some subset of the investigators and a larger, more comprehensive study that would build a larger body of data and samples for everybody else. And we funded that with the Center of Excellence grant, and that was key because having that large pot of funding allowed us to attract more investigators and support the greater study that we knew we needed to do. So the point of the study and how that framed the work we did further was to figure out a structure by which we can join forces to get further faster in a way that actually works. The collaboration that we started ultimately united 44 competing labs across five continents uh, across academic industry and government studies into a single comprehensive effort to figure out what antibodies against viruses like Ebola are best and what are the features that define best so that we can find them faster in vitro. And I'll show you the kind of results we got. So we looked at 200 different monoclonals, the best from everybody's group across three years. And on the y-axis, these are the samples we looked at and the horizontal axis is everything we measured about them. We had enough data uh, that we could start to do machine learning of what were the things that would lead to protection. So everybody in the field gave the samples from their own labs so that their own lab's data was invested in the pool of deciding what was best and why. Everything was kept blinded. Everyone could continue to publish. We knew that if we wanted to bring in the students and postdocs, they were going to need to get something for their careers. So we just devised the studies that they're individual pieces that for people could get first author papers. Because, you know, if you publish one paper with 100 authors, 98 are not first or last. You can do asterisks, but, you know, it's not quite the same thing. And we had experts in all the different techniques to compare all the antibodies side by side, apples to apples. Because what we were finding was in different labs, an assay would give different results. And we made all the data immediately available. So we were able to measure lots of different features about all the different antibodies and start to correlate which features came along with other features, which things drove each other. We could do logistic regression to figure out what are the things that would predict whether the animal model would survive, meaning a blue feature was good and a red feature was bad that didn't link to survival. A big bar was something that was an important determinant, a little bar was not so important. And what the field had previously measured success turned out it was only moderately predictive, that's where it says previous benchmark. We found better measures of neutralization 
we found lots of aspects of the immune system or, or FC recruitment that turned out to drive protection. So we're able to figure out what are the features that drive protection, what epitopes were linked to those features, and we were able to inform the development of six new therapeutics where there had been none before. And one of the criticisms of the grant, and this was reviewer two, there, there's always reviewer two, Reviewer two worried, if you're working on the same samples in everybody else's lab, they're out there already, and you're doing the same experiments that everyone's already doing, are you gonna learn anything new? And you're just gonna come up with the same answer, but more slowly. And the answer was, by putting the things together and having a multidisciplinary approach and creating a larger single body of data that was universally shared, we actually did find things that couldn't have been found other ways. What we ultimately got from that one grant were 78 different papers, and 10 students, were post 10 students got the data that gave them their PhDs. We were able to revise the research pipeline to focus on things that were more predictive of in vivo success instead of less predictive, and there are six therapies now where there weren't any before. And the study nearly killed us, but it seemed like it worked, and we wrote it up, and uh, we swore to never do it again. Until we got a call from the Gates Foundation when coronavirus broke out. And many of these sorts of images are quite familiar to you in the medical field. And the issue that the Gates Foundation and the NIH were having at the onset of the coronavirus pandemic was that again, companies were trying to mobilize antibody therapeutics because we didn't know if a vaccine would work. Even if a vaccine would work, it wasn't gonna be available right now, and you could give antibodies immediately to protect somebody who was vulnerable or treat somebody who was infected. And understanding what antibodies were best would help you shape what your vaccine or your second generation vaccine would be. And the challenge was that there were uh, dozens of different companies each mobilizing antibody therapies, and each company had evaluated theirs and, and had really good molecules based on the assay in that firm. And how was the NIH to determine which were the ones they would put in their clinical trials? Because there's just a limited number of beds and a limited number of dollars, and they couldn't encompass them all. And so what they wanted was an independent academic to sort them out. So we would get over 400 competing antibody therapies from mostly companies this time instead of academics and a few universities. And we were to compare them side by side in a multidisciplinary analysis to figure out which ones were best, which ones should be supported for the clinical trials, what are the things about them that would lead to protection, could we put together cocktails that were better than any one group could alone, right? What if the best combination is one antibody from Washington and one antibody from Tokyo, and you'd never know until they were the same room together? And then after a couple of months, the study became, which antibodies can survive this onslaught of mutation, and why? What's special about them? So this is what the study looked like to me. Part of the agreement in all of these studies, to make it very fair, was that I, the PI, I am blinded. I have no idea whose antibody is whose, and so if I advocate for sample 38, it's completely based just on the data that I know for sample 38. So we had 410 antibodies in here, uh, and this is what they looked like to me, just the blinded samples. Our program officers knew which was which, so they could do what the, the work they needed to do behind the scenes, and we had a program manager that would communicate to the antibody owners. So the antibody owners knew which sample were theirs, and they could track its progress in, in the, in the publicly available database, and then they could see if the data we had agreed with the data they had, and if they wanted to continue to invest in that molecule or invest in something else. One of the interesting things about this study was that because the antibodies came from so many different places, they had been discovered in many different ways from different sources and had been chosen for to be that company's lead therapeutic with different criteria. So in this pool, we had antibodies that came from survivors of the original SARS 20 years ago, survivors of the, you know, the first wave of SARS-CoV-2, antibodies from vaccinees came in later, and then other things, things that weren't a natural Y-shaped IgG, but some kind of engineered multivalent thing or nanobodies. We're able to compare some of those different things as well. And the way the study worked is that all the antibodies came into my lab 
they were kind of quality controlled and blinded. We did all the paperwork and then we sent them out to different experts in evaluating antibodies in different ways. And all of the data went immediately into a publicly available database where any coronavirus researcher could just download it, drop it into their Excel file or whatever else and analyze it any way they wanted. Now the first task before us, because we had 400 different antibodies, was to sort them out in some way. Now as a structural biologist, I tend to think about things ge you know, geometrically. Do they bind here? Do they bind here? Do they bind here? And so we went about it with high throughput um, surface plasmon resonance. So this is the structure of the coronavirus spike. Uh, this view is with the viral membrane at the bottom and the target cell membrane at the top. And one of those receptor binding domains has lifted up to interact with ACE2. So now we've rotated you around and you're standing on the human cell looking down into the coronavirus spike. And I'm gonna zoom into one receptor binding domain. This is where a lot, of, this is a very immunogenic area, a lot of antibodies, antibody therapeutics are targeted to that site. And here are the locations of some of the point mutations that emerged early in the pandemic. So you can divide that domain into quadrants. And one of the first ideas early in the pandemic, when the world had just a handful of Canada antibodies, was to sort the epitopes like a clock face, one, two, three, four. And that was the basis for organizing antibodies. What we found was that because we had 400, we could sort them into finer bins. And the precise spot recognized was remarkably predictive of how that antibody would behave, much more so than I would have ever predicted. So we used a Carterra Lodestar analysis and actually donated the time and instruments to sort everything out geometrically to figure out what bound to this epitope and the degrees to which they would overlap each by each other. We could get seven major communities and then divide those into subgroups based in fine gradations of where they bound on the spike and the degree to which they blocked ACE2 and other things. And then we did a lot of structural biology to get a sense of not just the footprint of where that antibody landed, but the angle that it approached from, because that determined the geometry of the binding arms, of, of the two binding arms of the IgG, and that turned out to be important later. So we were able to come up with finer bins, and those finer bins, where they bound, determined how well they would work. What I liked about this is that that high throughput surface plasma and resonance you can do in a couple hours, and it wound up determining everything else we learned for the next year. So if we sort them into groups, we can determine the degree to which these antibodies neutralize virus. We have some that are quite effective in recognition of other sites that was less effective. By that footprint, we could also figure out which ones were susceptible to what emerging mutations in the world. So you could have a library on deck that say, this molecule will or will not be effective against this variant. This molecule will or not be effective against that variant. And combining susceptibility to mutation with geometric recognition and steric overlap, we could make pairings of cocktails that hadn't been made before and give people guidance for how they might modulate their therapy. And that was quite useful for a number of the companies competing because the company might have had a two antibody cocktail of their own, but one of them was escaped and they needed a new partner. So we could do the matchmaking based on other molecules they may not have seen before. So we helped do a lot of different therapeutic design in the background. Based on that information, we we're then able to predict how antibodies would behave based on what footprint they landed on. Some of these kinds of antibodies would only bind monovalently, one arm down with the other FABM space. Some would bind bivalently. Some could cross-link different spikes together. The cross-linkers punched above their weight in in vivo protection. And we wrote all that up, and we were pretty happy with it, and we were happy through Delta. And then Omicron emerged, and no one was happy. And, and the trouble with Omicron is that there were so many mutations that none of the antibodies were quite as effective anymore. And so we went through our giant pile of therapeutic assets to figure out what would still neutralize Omicron and why. So I'm gonna show you 5,600 neutralization experiments and we're gonna blot them by color. So if they neutralize the virus, it's a blue spot. And if they don't, it's white and everything else in between is in between. If we take all of the antibodies and their ability to neutralize original virus now through mu, you can separate them by the epitope. You can see like this. So you want the consistent blue spots. If before Omicron, 
we see that these antibodies in the purple blocks, boxes tend to be variant resistant. These look pretty good. By the time we had gone from original virus all the way through the mu variant, 23% of the original therapeutic panel was still active. So that's a tremendous loss, but there's still 23%. If we now go to Omicron and we add in a few more different types of Omicron, we're looking at the pink boxes, only 5% of the antibody panel is still effective. So that's, again, a tremendous loss, but we still have that 5%. And we wondered what was special about that 5%. Some of them do what you might expect. They recognize some piece of the spike that never changes. The other ones were more of a puzzle, and this was really fascinating to me, that they keep neutralizing no matter what variant, even though we know that the footprint they land on is subject to tremendous selective pressure. And these are in that orange group, too, that they hit the crest of the receptor binding region, right at a place that's undergoing lots and lots of sampling to improve binding to the receptor. So the antibodies in that group were fascinating to me because they kept working no matter what mutation arose, even though I knew that all those mutations were right in their footprint. So how could that be and what was happening there? Well, we looked at those complexes by electron microscopy to figure it out. And I'll see if you can see it. So these are the antibodies in the class that still neutralize Omicron. So I'm showing you their code number in the study, 294, 299, 316. I'm showing you at the very bottom the images from EM of the actual recombinant spike antibody complexes dropped on the electron microscopy grids, and then some cartoons of what's going on in a three-dimensional reconstruction of the spike. So the coronavirus spike is in white and gray. The antibodies are in orange. The FC is flexible. It's attached, but you don't see it. But you see in the orange bunny ears, the two FAB fragments anchored down at the spike. Sometimes you see a third, sometimes you see the hole in the center of the FAB. So those are the guys that still neutralize. Compared to them to the ones that hit the same footprint, more or less, but do not continue to neutralize. And the difference is, you see a lot of them binding with one arm. If they bind like that, all the time or some of the time, they don't survive Omicron. If they bind like this, they do. So the ones that persist in neutralizing, no matter what variant emerges, bind fully bivalently. We see one complete IgG anchored with both arms onto the spike, or one at a spare, occupying the third site in the, in the spike trimer. The ones that don't neutralize or fail to neutralize are ones that their geometry allows them to just hang on with one arm or half on and half off. So something about the avidity allows them to overcome the mutational substitutions. So what we learn from that is that the geometry of the angle of approach very much matters for make designing vaccines that will stand the test of time. So having gone through this study, and there's a world of data that I, I didn't have time to show you today, but what we can figure out is that we want to rapidly create a lot of antibodies, bin them in a couple hours, and then based on the binning, how tightly they bind and how well they neutralize are equally effective. You can then sort them out and put them into the mouse models and choose structures to get your therapeutics more faster. I took that kind of work that we had done and I applied it to my institute. So about two years ago, I took leadership of my institute, not just as a professor, but as the president. Now, La Jolla Institute for Immunology is a nonprofit private research institute. It's like immunology utopia. We are 450 staff and 25 faculty and uh, no bureaucracy and beautiful cores that provide like Nordstrom level customer service to the faculty. And from our little institute, uh, we're top five in the world for a focus on human immunology. So I have some of the best faculty in the world in this area. And when I moved in, I thought, well, because I was recruited there four years ago, I thought this is just a sensational place. And we have the expert in the T cells, and the expert in the B cells, the expert in this and the other. But again, I was seeing a lot of research that was pretty siloed. They did their study, and they got their R01. And he did his study, and he got his R01. And she did her study, and she did her R01. And I thought, there's got to be an opportunity 
for the faculty together to figure out how they might align to cast a greater direction. Like instead of making baby steps, one grant and one study section approval at a time, where can we together make a giant leap? I want to show you where we landed, and I'd love to hear from you later what you think about this and how you might apply that to nephrology. When I thought as the new leader of the institute, what would be the right strategy going forward, I thought of a couple of things. First of all, any institutional strategy for an academic institute has to be led by what the faculty wanted to do anyway. If the new leader shows up and says, we're going to work on mitochondria, the tenured faculty are going to say, no, we're not. <laughs> right? You cannot tell tenured faculty what to do. They're going to do what they intended to do anyway. What you can do is figure out what they wanted to do and put resources behind it and figure out how it aligns. And whatever the strategy is going to be, it's got to be something that's very exciting and very important. And it's got to fit with who we already are and what we already have. You can hire a few more faculty and you can buy a few more instruments, but mostly, it's got to amplify the culture and the focus they already had. And I thought about how I might do this, how I might figure out what aligned the faculty that hadn't bubbled up before. And having been a member of a faculty, I know the phenotype. If you put 20 professors in a room and you ask them to agree that the sky is blue, they really won't. <laughs> and if you ask 20 faculty to brainstorm, you're going to hear the loudest too. You won't hear the rest of them. And pretty much in brainstorming, people will land on and spend most of their time on the first one or two things presented. And I really wanted to hear out the assistant professors because they're the ones that are going to carry the strategy forward. And so we went through a process where we instead broke them into small groups to do what faculty do best, which is think in quiet contemplation and come up with new ideas. And I asked them to come up with the answers to three questions. And when they came to the meeting, put them down on paper, and take that paper and rotate it one to the left. And then the rule was, yes, comma, and. Do not do the thing where you say, well, that's never going to work because, and here's the caveat you haven't thought about, and allow me to have a platform to expand on my own research. What I wanted them to do was look at what their colleagues' ideas for where we should go were, and find, yes, and, how this intersects with my research. How, what I am excited about in your ideas. Write that down, put the paper one to the left. Go all the way around so everybody has a chance to think about all their colleagues' ideas and figure out how their work intersects and what's most exciting about that. And then we had really lively conversations and we recorded the transcripts of all of this. And I and my chief of staff listened to these transcripts over and over again over a Christmas vacation until we distilled from them different directions for the Institute. So this is what it looked like where some of my faculty uh, you know, having it, this was an exciting conversation about where we, what we could do better in cancer immunotherapy and so on. And we did a lot of whiteboarding. And this is what I asked them to think about. What are the most important questions in our field? Where are the major gaps in understanding that we haven't yet addressed? Who should we hire as we build our faculty? What kind of topics, what kind of colleagues? And what do you really want to be doing? Not what you're doing now, but what do you want your legacy to be? When you give your Nobel Prize acceptance speech in the shower, what is the research that you are getting that award for, and what is the difference between what you're doing now and what you really want to be doing? Is it people? Is it resources? Is it ideas? How do we get you to the legacy that you want to create here? And then they wrote things down and they expanded on each other's ideas and they came up with lots of collaborative ideas and directions. And we worked on this over the year and I, you know, I wrote, I think you said this. Is this right? And they ripped it apart and put it back together and came back. And over, over the course of the year, we evolved four different directions that the Institute could go and strategic direction that aligned many of the different labs and cast a greater vision and could get us in a larger leap forward for a greater body of information. And I want to talk to you about just one of them because I think in my conversations with, with Diane, this is quite important for, uh, for medicine and and also in kidney disease and health. And that's the differences between males and females in the immune system. That every cell in our body is either XX or XY, not just reproductive cells. Your heart is XX or XY, your brain is XX or XY, your kidney is XX or XY. There's a lot of immune genes on that X chromosome. So females are mosaic. We would look like calico cats if you could see the, the expression of whether it's the mom's X or the dad's X in different sectors of our body. 
being mosaic, females have kind of twice the palette to paint from. They have, you know, two different forms of those genes at the same time. And we learned growing up at our mother's knee that one of those X's is silenced, but it turns out not all of it. Only about 75% of that X is silenced. So females are sometimes transcription, have both copies of that gene transcriptionally active. We also know that it's not just what is encoded, but the level to which it is activated and used. That, and that is often determined by hormones. So estrogens in general tend to be immune activating and androgens in general tend to be immunosuppressive. So when we do studies, we find that there are 1,900 different genes launched differently from the autosomes, the non-X, non-Y chromosomes, whether the cell is male or female. And that has profound effects on lots of different things. We know that there are very sex-specific differences in how males and females experience disease. But the treatments that we try to give are one size fits all. We give one checkpoint blocking cancer immunotherapy to activate an immune system, even though males receive that and launch an immune army, females receive that and launch the army, the navy, the air force, and the marines. So females are 50% more likely to have an immune-related adverse effect to the same therapy. But we just have one therapy. We haven't thought to make two versions. You know, the market has thought to make two different versions of blue genes for men and women. Why do we only have one version of a life-saving immunotherapy? What we want to do is put information behind that. If we can understand the differences between males and females at the molecular level, we have some information to guide how we might have a better approach. We're also, by separating the samples, coming up with individual genes that we hadn't found before, or individual metabolites we hadn't found before, that are linked to protection from disease or advancing in a disease. And that tells us maybe what the mechanism is or how we might treat it. There are lots of differences in the immune system between males and females. In a viral infection, males have twice the viral load of females. So man flu is a, a very real thing. That they are honestly much sicker than females. While males lack as robust an immune response to viruses and pathogens, that greater power of the female immune system means that women are much more prone to autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. And that's really quite important. Uh, there are six cases of autoimmunity in a woman for every man, and this is growing every decade. There must be some environmental effect as well. So it's become a leading cause of death in girls and women. Cases are increasing. We don't know why, but we know there's a sexual dimorphism there. So that's a new frontier to understand that cause. It's also important for our, our brains. Women are twice as likely to get Alzheimer's, and that's not because we live longer. There's something else. We have more neurofibrillary tangles. It looks very different. Males are more likely to get Parkinson's. Heart disease is different. Heart disease in a man looks like the classic chest pain, and it's easy to recognize, and that's what we're all taught to look for. Heart disease in a woman is not the same thing. It's blockage of the microvasculature, and it manifests as fatigue and nausea. It may be harder to figure out if a woman is having a heart attack than a man. There's also a hormonal difference. Women are protected from heart disease before menopause, but it looks like a different disease with different manifestations after menopause. There's different populations. We need more information. What we're trying to do then is align our different laboratories and our different tools and the different diseases that we work on to mine in this area. And you know, the first thing we saw was kind of a glint of gold that suggests there might be information there. And the more we dig, the more we find that Cellular and molecular drivers of immune system differences, um, whether it's genetically encoded or the effects of hormones, can be quite significant. And it's a source of information about what the molecular causes of disease may be. And I've given a couple of diseases here that we know have a sex link, but there are many, many more. And there may be an opportunity to better tailor therapeutic opportunities for the patient. So I mentioned out of many one, how do 13 colonies become a single nation? I've, here I've said out of many three. There are lots of people I want to thank for these three different studies and approaches in different areas. Um, for the Ebola and the coronavirus studies, NIH for support, coronavirus study, also the GHR Foundation, the Bill and the Gates Foundation. I really want to thank all the investigators and the companies who are willing to put their corporate assets into the hands of an academic to tease apart what worked well and why. And I'd really like to thank the faculty of LJI for 
working with us and doing something new and coming up with some new directions that will, we think, launch and accelerate human health. And I'm delighted to be here and to meet all of you, and I'm looking forward to further discussions.